Hey guys, Pastor Jim here for a, another week. Turning your Bibles to Luke chapter seven. Uh, Want to continue in our study uh, in this great gospel uh, of Luke. We've been walking through the gospel of Luke verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Uh, Going to take us uh, another year or so to get through it. It's been great. Uh, Dr. Luke, uh, he's a physician. Uh, he's the author. And he said at the beginning of this book that he wanted to he wanted to give us something so that we could be certain. He wanted to give us an eyewitness carefully or, uh, ordered account uh, so that we might be certain about what we believe. And in a world of uncertainty, uh, we need to grab a hold of something. And Luke is offering us Jesus to grab a hold of. Uh, and so we're looking to see uh, who this Jesus is and if this Jesus holds up. Uh, in our text uh, today, there's two stories here, two encounters with Jesus. Uh, and I think they're connected for a reason. I think what Luke is doing, placing these two things side by side, is trying to communicate something uh, uh, to us. He's trying to show us something uh, about ourselves and then show us something about Jesus. Okay. And so uh, real simple uh, time with you uh, uh, in this sermon. Won't take too long. Let's look at Luke chapter seven, starting in verse one, Luke writes, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him to the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, listen to what they say, he is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is one who built. Uh, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them when he was not far from the house. Then the centurion sent friends, saying to him, "Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not. Pres I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go." And he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd, this was a teachable moment that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found that Jesus had, had healed them, that the servant was well. And so you have this Roman centurion. He's not Jewish. He's a Gentile. He's not on the inside of the, you know, the, the religious communities, on the outside. Uh, he's, he's over 100 soldiers, so he's got some power. Uh, he's got some wealth. Centurions would make 100 times more than the soldiers of that day, and the soldiers weren't paid all that bad uh, themselves. And so he's living a good life, but he's facing a crisis. He has this servant who is highly valued by him. Uh, the, the language makes it sound like he was, you know, just a, a utilitarian relationship with the servant, like the servant was just useful to him. Uh, but, but in the language, there, there's, there is some sort of affection. There's some sort of personal uh, uh, relationship that the centurion has with the, the, the servant. He does seem to care for this servant. And what's interesting is that he doesn't go himself. He sends some leaders from the synagogue to get Jesus. This Gentile sends Jewish leaders to go to Jesus and ask him to come heal his servant, uh, probably because of this deep ethnic divide between Jews and Gentiles in that day, where uh, uh, a, a Jewish person wouldn't come under the roof of a Gentile, uh, much less a, a rabbi, a, a Jewish teacher like Jesus uh, or definitely, you know, in that day, the, the, the customs were that they would not uh, hang out. They wouldn't talk. They, they wouldn't uh, interrelate in any sort of way. Uh, but apparently this guy does have a good relationship with the Jewish people of his town. In verse 5, the Jewish leaders say, hey, Jesus, he loves our nation. Uh, he built our synagogue. All right? So Brother Centurion dropped some serious coin to uh, fund the building of their uh, their synagogue. And, and so maybe he's a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Maybe he's what they call a God-fearer. Uh, he has converted in some sense to a belief in the, the, the God of Israel, uh, but has not converted completely into the culture of Judaism. Maybe it was just a political move. Uh, we're not exactly sure. We don't know. But the leaders say to Jesus in verse 4, he is worthy to have you do this for him. Really interesting. 
that they still have that kind of paradigm that they're operating in. That for God to do something, for Jesus to heal this man's servant, for God to move in your life in some sort of way, you have to be worthy. But then what does the centurion say a couple of verses later? He says, no, 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 Lord, don't, don't even come all the way. Don't trouble yourself, for I am not worthy. See, the difference here isn't that the Jewish leaders didn't have faith in, in, and the centurion did. It's that, that they had faith in the worthiness of the man, right? the worthiness of the individual, while the centurion had faith in the worthiness of Jesus. That's the difference. It wasn't that the centurion had faith and the, and the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish leaders didn't. It was what they had faith in. All of us have faith. You can be an atheist, an agnostic, a Buddhist, a Baptist, and you have faith because we're all trusting in something. We're believing in something. Even if you don't believe in God, there's a, there's a faith in that. Uh, you can't prove that there isn't a God. Uh, you, have to, you have to have faith to get there. Uh, you can try to point to some evidence that there is no God. How can there be suffering and evil in the world and, and there be a, a, a God? Uh, how could uh, there be a God and, and that God allow the Holocaust to happen? Uh, you know, uh, how can there be 25 seasons of The Bachelor if God exists? Right? There's evidence that you could point to uh, that there is no God. And I can point to the evidence uh, around us that, that, that I think does point to a God. But both of us need faith to lead to where we believe whatever we believe. And so we all have faith, and the predominant uh, faith in our culture is a faith in ourselves. We can make gods out of everything, but mostly we make gods out of ourselves. We trust mostly in ourselves. Uh, it's a faith in our ability, in our worthiness, in our uh, ability to reason. Or we have faith in humanity, perhaps, despite so much evidence to the contrary. Uh, that was their paradigm, too. Uh, religious people often will be the ones that most put faith in themselves, uh, where it's a faith in their morality, it's a faith in the strength of their convictions, or in that their convictions are the right ones. We have faith in our faith, uh, you know, or uh, as if the worthiness of our faith is what we are measured by, or the worthiness of our faith is what pleases God. But it's not the strength of our faith that matters. Jesus is clearly going to teach that and teach that all throughout the Gospel of Luke. It's not the strength of our faith that matters. It's the object of our faith. A weak faith in a strong God leads to life. A strong faith in a weak God leads to death. Uh, you, you can have two people uh, and two chairs. I don't, I don't have two chairs in here. But you can have two people and two chairs. And, and one of the chairs is broken. And, and one person could have great conviction, right? Great conviction that that chair is going to hold him. He is going to sit down in that broken chair, trusting fully that it would hold him. While the other man, the other person, the other woman, doesn't matter, the other person could be quite nervous about the chair that they're going to sit in. I don't know, maybe they've fallen before. They're, they're clumsy. They, they've had a historically bad luck with chairs. Uh, but they're nervous about it, but they are sitting in the perfectly good chair, quite gingerly, unsure, but they sit down. Which one falls? It doesn't matter how sure the other person was. If he sits in the broken chair, brother's going down, right? That's just the reality because the object of our faith is what matters more than the strength of our faith. Or, or take this story that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. We, we, were, we were at the pool with some friends uh, and my buddy Joe dunked me in the water because even though we're in our 40s, uh, as soon as you get some guys in a the pool, they become kids again, right? Uh, and so he 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 pushes me under the water, and and so I'm under the water. And listen, I wear contacts, okay? So I, I don't open my eyes uh, uh, under the water. Uh, and, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take him down. Right? I'm gonna he he took me down. I'm gonna take him down. And so I I'm under the water, eyes closed, and I turn around and I. I, I swim right up to Joe and 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 I, I, I'm gonna start to pull him down, right? I'm gonna take him down. I had great faith that it was Joe. Uh, I had, uh, I was deeply convictional that these legs that I had grabbed were Joe's 
legs. I just knew it. Right? Maybe they felt a little too smooth, but I, I knew that I'd grabbed Joe and I was taking him down. And so I come up to the surface and it's some random gal in the pool. Uh, and everyone's laughing and she looks terrified. And I just looked at her and said, I'm a pastor. It's okay. And swam away. I don't, I don't know. I didn't know what else to say. Um, that's, that's the kind of faith that sometimes we have where we're deeply convictional in the wrong thing. It's the strength of the strength of our faith does not matter. It's the object of our faith that does. Uh, The centurion didn't have faith in his faith. Right? He didn't have faith in his own worthiness, in, his own, in himself. He had faith in Jesus. And, and he had faith that Jesus could heal his servant without even being there to do it. You just say it and it'll happen, Jesus. It's a, it's a, it's a marvelous faith. And I just love verse 9 where Jesus, he, he marvels at him. Jesus marveled at his faith. I, I was just thinking about this. Like what, Je- what gets Jesus' attention isn't our goodness, but our faith in his goodness. What got Jesus' attention isn't isn't the centurion's power, but his faith in Jesus' power. It isn't who we are that gets Jesus' attention, but our faith in who he is, that that, that he marvels, that that gets his attention. I just love that we can get God's attention, and I love that that's the way that we do it. But then But then look at this second story. I'll I'll show you because I want to make the connection now where the second story is less about us and our faith and more about Jesus uh, and and, and who he is. Look look at verse 11. I want to to make this connection. Soon afterward, so this happened a little bit while later, he went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out the only son of his father, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the buyer and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. So so Jesus rolls up on this funeral. Him and his boys are are traveling about, and he he rolls up on this funeral, and this widow's only son had died. And and he's a a grown man. He's maybe in his late teens, early 20s. Uh, We don't know for sure, but this... Um, in this culture, he's literally all she's got, uh, right? She didn't just lose her son. She lost her livelihood, her protection, her everything. A, a woman in this culture and then a widow in this culture would be completely dependent on the men in, in her life. And so it says in verse 13 that Jesus had compassion on her. Uh, this is the emotion that the gospel writers, uh, the, 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 the biblical books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, that they most attribute to Jesus. That at Jesus' deepest heart, like if you open up Jesus, what you're going to find is compassion. Compassion. Uh, the word that they're using, it literally means from the bowels, right? from the gut. Uh, it's a visceral response where Jesus, he, he doesn't just have pity on her. Jesus doesn't just feel sad for her. He's physically responding to the situation. And he's not moved because this man is dead. He's moved for this widow who is now without provider or protector. He is viscerally moved in his being, his very being for the this woman and her her situation. And so Jesus for 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 Jesus his compassion always moves him to act. He doesn't ever just feel sorry for somebody. It, it does something in him. He has to do something about it. And so he walks up to the coffin and he speaks to the man. It doesn't touch him and he rises from the dead. He, he speaks to the man and he speaks to the dead and Jesus' words bring life. They always have. Jesus' words you know, brought about creation. Now they're just bringing about recreation. And the man hears him and sits up and begins to speak. And so two, two things immediately come to mind for me. First, what the heck did that guy say when he started talking? Like, I want to know. I wish Luke would have said, like, here's what he said. 
uh, you know, Ma, what's, who are these people? What's going on? I'm hungry. You know, I don't, I don't know. Like what, what did he say when he stood up, got up and started talking? I just, I, 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 I'm, I'm intrigued by what he said. But then the second thing that came to mind is this, everyone who dies in faith, everyone in, who dies in faith will be raised up again, just like this. Everyone. Like all of our sons and daughters who died in the womb, all of our miscarriages, and there have been way too many in our church, all of our kids will one day hear Jesus say, wake up, Ezekiel. Wake up, Shiloh. Wake up, Olivia. And they will get up. And all of us who are watching, who have died in faith, will hear his voice too. Wake up, Jim. Wake up, Jennifer, wake up. And the life-giving, resurrecting, powerful word of Jesus will breathe life into our new bodies. And everything we gave our life for here on earth will feel really small compared to the eternal weight of glory that we'll have then in him and with him. And so here's, here's the connection between this story and the one before The faith that we have, okay, the faith that we have in Jesus is a trust in a deeply compassionate and unbelievably powerful God. Our faith is in him. You know, the the world, it operates in faith all the time. We all believe in something. We trust in something, and then we're operating out of that trust. We, we, we do nothing outside of uh, things that we trust in and believe in. It, it, it's constantly happening. Everything that we do and think and say is, is not happening in a vacuum, but coming out of something, some things, some ones that we have put our trust or our hope or our faith in. We are interacting with the world around us, trusting in something. And we're trying to get the attention of the world around us so we can we can make money or get married or be successful or or whatever. And to do that, we have to operate in some sort of you know set of beliefs or trusts. Uh, so, like right now, for example, I have a choice in this very moment. This thing that I'm doing right now, I can uh, I have a choice because to get your attention, I have to be good at this thing that I'm doing right now. I've got to be good at it. I've got to have faith. I've got to trust in my ability or my knowledge or my charisma to to keep you, uh, uh, you know, online right now watching this and not not a thousand other things uh, uh, to, to so that I can be successful at this thing called preaching. Or or I could choose something else. I could choose to put my trust in Jesus that to to take to take take care of this moment for us. Right, this relationship that we have right now, like I can trust in me or I can trust in in him to work this thing out. And it's not that my abilities or my knowledge or, or whatever doesn't come into play in this moment, but if in the end my hope in this moment is in me, then that's gonna be different than if my hope in this very moment is in him. Okay, my point is simply this. We are all putting our faith in something all of the time and every moment. And it's going to affect how we interact and operate in the world around us. But in our world, right, in this world where our values are relative and our relationships are transactional and our identities are fragile, our faith will be futile if it's in ourselves or one another. You're going to find your faith failing you if you find yourself putting it in either you, your abilities, or in other people and, and your hope in them. It's going to fail you. Uh, I, like I'm, I, for example, I'm trying to grow in my compassion. Like I want, to, I want to grow in that. I want to work out the sin in my heart and the selfishness of my life that keeps me from being more compassion, uh, more compassionate. But man, the most compassionate person watching, and it ain't me talking, it's somebody out there watching. The, the most compassionate person watching doesn't even come close to the compassion that Jesus has. Everybody else will fail you compared to him. Or, or in the same way, I'm trying to grow in my abilities. Like I'm trying to work this thing out. What I'm doing, I want to grow in my abilities as a leader, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a dad, as a husband. I want to grow in those. But the most able person out there doesn't even come close to the power of God in Christ Jesus, right? The power that Jesus has. 
And so you can have a lot of confidence in yourself. You can have a strong conviction that you're going to make it, uh, that you're going to be successful. But that is just like me with my eyes closed underwater, grabbing some random, random gal's legs, man. Uh, in the end, at some point, uh, uh, things are going to go bad for you. Uh, things are just going to go bad. And so let, let me... Let me see if I can show you something because there's one thing that I'm, I'm I'm wanting you to do. There's one thing that I think I think Luke is trying to call out in us in these two stories, where where Jesus says the centurion's faith is greater than anything that he has seen. What else does Jesus say in Luke about our faith? Let, let me just show you a few things. Um, in, in Luke chapter seven, this this prostitute, this woman of the city. Uh, comes to to see Jesus. Jesus is actually uh, having dinner with some some, some with a religious leader, uh, one of those people that didn't didn't quite think that they needed Jesus. And so this woman of the city, this prostitute, comes to Jesus. And man, she's like she is anointing him with oil, and she is she is crying tears on his feet, and and she is uh, I mean she is broken up, and, and and all she knows to do is to come to Jesus, and so she comes to Jesus. And in Luke chapter 7, 50, listen to what Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Yeah, your, your faith has saved you. And then, and then in Luke, in Luke chapter 8, it's that famous story. If you've spent any time in church, you, you, you've, you've heard the story of Jesus calming the storm or the disciples there in the boat. And, 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 you know, these are fishermen, man, like, uh, and, and, and they, they, they don't get afraid easy, but, but the winds and the waves are going crazy. It's a big storm and they're terrified. And Jesus is sleeping, right? Brothers taking a nap, uh, and not worried at all. And so they wake up Jesus and like, Jesus, you know what? Aren't you afraid? Aren't you going to do something? What, what about this? The, this this storm and and Jesus of course calms the storm rebu- rebukes the winds and the waves but then he looks at the disciples and he says in Luke eight verse twenty five where is your faith where's your faith and then later in, in Luke this this woman there's all these crowds run, running up against Jesus bumping up against Jesus and 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 this woman touches Jesus she's got this uh, this this physical issue that she's had for twelve years and. And, and Jesus feels power run out of his body. Like everybody's bumping into him. Everybody's, but, it, but he feels power come out of his body. And so he's like, hey, who touched me? And everybody's been touching them. But, but he's like, yeah, I, I know somebody specifically touched me because power came out from me. And so this woman, she just kind of sheepishly comes forward and says, I, I touched you and I immediately was healed. And he looks at her in verse 48 and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Yeah, your faith. And then, and then later in Luke chapter 12, Jesus is talking about anxiety and just like how, how stressed we can be and how, 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 how fretful we can be and how anxious we can, we can get. And he's saying, man, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be worried about tomorrow. And he, and he, says, in, he says in Luke 12, 28, but if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? What are you worried about? And then he says, oh, you of little faith. Yeah, you have little faith, he says. And then, and then there's this moment where, where Jesus is talking about temptations to sin and how we should forgive one another seven times, like over and over and over. And the, the disciples are getting a little bit overwhelmed by it. And, and they say in Luke chapter 17, like they've just been hearing Jesus talk about faith all, all this time, like for years, right? He's talking about faith, talking about faith. And finally, in Luke 17, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Like, would you help our faith, Jesus? And then, and then Jesus says, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, like that big, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And then in Luke 17, this leopard is healed, and he's got this skin disease, and he's healed, and he's, he comes before Jesus and just says, thank you, and he's praising him for it. And Jesus says to him, rise and go your way, because your faith has made you well. And then just, just one more for now, anyways, uh, in Luke chapter 18, this blind man's on the side of the road and hears that Jesus is coming and just starts shouting, asking, asking Jesus to come see him. And, 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 and he says, hey, I'm blind. I want you to heal me. And Jesus says in verse 42, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. 
So over and over and over in in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus is talking about faith. It's a big deal. And over and over and over, he is celebrating the faith of some, and he's rebuking the faith of, of others, the lack of faith in others. And all the while, he also seems to be communicating that only a little bit of faith is necessary. Like there seems to be this compassion in Jesus that meets us where we are, right? whatever we are, wherever we are at. But then there's this invitation that he that he, that he, that he, invi- he invites us to go deeper with him. Right? So he meets us where we are. He loves us enough to meet us where, where we are, but he also loves us enough to, to, to move us along into a deeper and more abiding relationship and, and trust in him. So here's my point in all of this. What if today was an invitation for you to grow in your faith? What if that's all this was? Your, your 30 minutes on a live stream, your, 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 this relationship we have right now, you and I, preacher to congregation, what if this moment was just that Jesus was inviting you to take a deeper step of faith in him, right? To lay down one more thing that you've been trusting in and to trust in him just a little bit deeper, just a little bit more, to, to move one more step closer to him. What if, what if that's what today was for you? Um, so let, let's, let, let's chat about that for a moment, what that could look like. This all means that Jesus isn't looking for the worthy, right? The, 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 the centurion wasn't worthy, this widow who has no protection and, and, and no one to provide for her. There's nothing about her that is worthy. Uh, there's nothing that we've seen in Luke of, of those who have interacted with Jesus and have rightly responded in faith to him that, that, uh, that, that they have been found worthy. He's looking for a worthy faith, not a worthy man. He's looking for that faith that's in him, not a faith that's in faith. That's what gets his attention. And so we've got to like... We've got to change our paradigm. We can't be like those leaders of, uh, 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 those Jewish leaders that the centurion sent that said, hey, he's a worthy man. He's worthy of this. Jesus, you should heal his servant. He's worthy of this. We've got to get out of that paradigm and that mindset still. We've got to get out of the rat race of the way in which the world would operate, right? Where we we try to be worthy. And listen, I get it. Like I, I get, we're, we're in the world and there's some things that we have to do in the world. Like we got to perform, we got to work hard, we got to do things. There's some things to accomplish. There's some things that we have to, to do, but man, don't take that into your relationship with Jesus. That's not how he operates. That's not how he operates. Jesus is the only God who invites you as you are. Jesus is the only one who invites you as you are, but then he continues to invite you deeper into him. He doesn't leave you there. Right? His, his grace will change you, but you can come in any way. Right? In fact, it's the only way to come to him, unworthy. It's the only way to come to him, clinging to nothing but him. You know what I'm saying? Like life's hard. We're trying to accomplish things. We're trying to do things. We're trying to figure things out. We got to do good work and it's exhausting. Right? It's exhausting. And I don't mean life is bad. Like I love life. I'm in a, I'm in a joyful place right now, but it's hard. Right? Life is hard. But, but maybe... Maybe Jesus would be that one place where you didn't have to perform. What if if Jesus was that one person, that one person that you didn't have to try to please by what you did, by what you didn't do, by your performance in any sort of way? What if Jesus, what if your relationship with Jesus was purely based on, do you trust in him or do you trust in you? What if your relationship with Jesus was just this freeing invitation from a compassionate and powerful God who just said, hey man, I'm, I'm meeting you right where you are and then I just want you to come with me further still. What if your relationship with Jesus is just different than your relationship with everybody else in the world? Like, Take your biggest sins, you know, your darkest ones. They won't keep you from Jesus. They won't keep you from Jesus. They're not going to keep you from his grace because it's not our worthiness that connects us to him. It's just our faith in him and his worthiness. And so our biggest sins, we can actually go to Jesus with that. 
and we can go deeper into our faith and our relationship with Jesus despite them. Or take your littlest sins. Often it's our littlest sins that we don't go to Jesus with. Or we just kind of manage them and try to figure them out. They're not too huge. They're not going to shipwreck our life. They're not going to shipwreck our marriage. They're not going to put us in jail or something like that. They're just, there's just these things that we hate to do. We hate that we're like that. We hate that we do them. And so we're just going to try to figure it out, man. Like, I'm just going to figure this out. I need to be more worthy here. I need to be more worthy husband. I need to be more worthy friend. I need to be more of a worthy man. I should figure this out. And so we don't go to Jesus with them. Uh, at, at Men's Theology Night last week, uh, we had, you know, 90, 100 men in the, in, in the office up here and just, uh, men just talking about how we talk, like just how we speak to our wives, how we speak to our kids or how we speak about other people. And it's those little pet sins that men just nag on you and they're terrible and we hate them. And yet we just try to figure it out and we don't go to Jesus. But you don't go to Jesus after you figure things out. You go to Jesus with all your unworthiness. Because we don't go to Jesus worthy, we go to Jesus in faith. We, we step closer to him in faith. It's he who gives life. It's he who will speak into the, the dead corners of our heart, those dead spots in our life and breathe life into them to where, man, no, no longer maybe are we are we speaking in those kinds of ways or sinning in those kinds of ways or struggling in those kinds of ways? Because it's Jesus, it's our faith in Jesus that brings healing, not us trying to figure it out. I think Jesus is inviting you to take one more step, man. One more step. Right? To bring one more thing to him, to grow in your faith one little bit at a time. And here's the thing. Uh, even if our faith, uh, like even in our faith, he doesn't leave it uh, to us to figure out. The, the, the last time that, that Luke actually talks about faith uh, in, in his gospel, it's, it's this conversation between Jesus and Peter. Where, where Peter, it's in Luke chapter 24, where, where Peter, you know, just over and over and over comes off brash and, uh, you know, overconfident and arrogant. Uh, but in the end, He's going to lack faith and he's going to deny Jesus. And so Jesus is telling that. He's saying, bro, like you're going to deny me. Uh, your, your, your trust is in yourself, uh, but, but it's going to fail you. It's going to go bad for you. You're going to deny me. It's coming for you. Your faith can't be in your faith. It has to be in me. But then he says this in verse 32 of chapter 22. He says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Listen to this. Even in our failure to grow in faith, Jesus is with us, encouraging us and strengthening us and interceding for us. Like he's inviting us deeper into faith, not because Jesus needs that from us somehow, but for our sake. For our sake, he invites us into a deeper faith in him. And all the while, even if we fail, it is Jesus that lifts us up, Jesus that is interceding, Jesus that is strengthening our faith. He doesn't leave it up to us to figure out even our faith on our own. Do you see how much freedom is in Jesus? See how much freedom is that there is to operate in relationship with Jesus and contrary to, to, to how, how paralyzing it is to operate in relationship to the world, like to, to just anything outside of Jesus. Listen to this, Hebrews 12, I'll close with this. Hebrews 12, it says that we are to fix our eyes on what? On our faith? Fix our eyes on ourselves? No, fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that did this thing perfectly. He's the one that uh, did not despise the shame of the cross, but went to the cross because of the joy that was set before him that he might make many sons and many daughters of the faith. And so we look to Jesus even as we are invited into a deeper faith in Jesus, even as we maybe say with the disciples, Jesus, help our faith. We look to Jesus and this compassionate and powerful God helps us, lifts us up, strengthens us, speaks life into us. The same God, the same power that can raise the dead will raise you up as well. 
Let me pray. Father, I pray for my friends, um, e even those, especially those who maybe now watching haven't had a faith in you, but now want to have a faith in you. Would you even strengthen them now? Would you even grab a hold of them now? That, that even as we, we try to grab a hold of more of you, you have already grabbed a hold of us. And so if you're watching, I just, and that's you, like you want to put your faith in Jesus. Do that right now. Or just right now, like you don't have to come to him worthy. You don't have to come to him figured out. You just come to him. It doesn't even have to be a strong faith. You don't even have to have all your questions answered, but, but you just want him. You want to put your trust in him and just confess that and, and pray that and he hears you. And for those of us that know Jesus, love Jesus, have been walking with Jesus, what is that invitation to grow deeper in your faith today, to take one more step today? What does that look like? God, would you lead us and help us as you speak to the hearts of, of so many that um, just have are watching at different times and at different places on their spiritual journey? Would you speak to their hearts to call them deeper into faith in you today. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.